Uh, this talk grew out of some notions I developed a number of years ago about this uh, debate that's always gone in society. Why do we support basic research at universities? You know, why can't we all just be engineers and produce products that are marketed two or three years after they're developed? And uh, in this talk, I look at some examples of basic science, uh, show how uh, it affects what we do, and uh, ultimately gives us some lessons for where we ought to be going. So that's why it's called cryptography, freedom, and democracy, and how basic science affects everyone. Uh, which hit the right key here. So here, here's a quote uh, that I found quite a few years ago in a nice little book called A Mathematician's Apology that some of you may have read by the famous Cambridge mathematician G.H. Hardy. Hardy and Littlewood were the two of the big names in mathematics in the first part of the 20th century. And you know, he said there's one comforting conclusion which is easy for a real mathematician. Real mathematics has no effects on war. No one has yet discovered any warlike purpose to be served by the theory of numbers or relativity. He threw that in, although he never worked in that field. And it seems very unlikely that anyone will do so for many years. He wrote this in 1940, and we'll see the significance of this date as we progress through this talk. Because he was wrong. He was wrong in spades, and he didn't know it. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is take three areas of basic science, relativity, quantum mechanics, and cryptography, and show how they've had an impact on modern society, even though if you presented them individually to the average citizen and say, does this have any impact in your life? And they'd say, of course not, can't possibly. Well, 1905 was the year that special relativity was introduced, which uh, is, has the one equation that virtually everybody on the planet who's been to school for more than about six years has heard of, E equals mc squared. They may not really understand the significance, but it's a relation between energy mass and the speed of light. The speed of light has been in the news this past week with the experiment at CERN, where they think they have fa neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. I was listening to Lisa Randall on talk of on uh, Science Friday on the way down, and she says most physicists don't believe this, that the experiment's probably wrong, but it, there's no harm in asking this question and going out and doing better measurements. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the important thing here was that C is a, a very big number, and C squared is an even bigger number, and so even if M is small, like a pound or so, when you multiply it by C squared, you get a tremendous amount of energy. And we'll see in a little bit what that meant. Uh, just eight years later, the Danish young scientist named Niels Bohr, who at the time was uh, in his mid-20s, developed a, a quantum theory of the atom. And uh, 13 years later, <clears throat> Erwin Schrodinger in Germany He's actually Austrian, but he was working in Germany. Uh, discovered what we now call a Schrodinger wave equation, which is the, um, th that's the handout from last time, but you're welcome to a copy if you want it one, uh, <coughs> which is the, the quantum mechanical wave equation we deal with today. And just 13 years after that, two uh, radio physicists in uh, Germany succeeded in splitting the atom. Now, they didn't know they had done so. Uh, they separated the results chemically, and they got products that were unexpected. And uh, Han had worked extensively for about 25 years with Lisa Meitner, who is, uh, had fled Germany in about 1934 and was working in, Sig in uh, Sweden. And she was on Christmas vacation with her nephew, Robert Otto Frisch in Utebori, which is on the west coast of Sweden. And they went out on a 24th December outing, she walking and he on skis, and talked about this. And in that walk, she basically worked out what had happened, that there was indeed fission. And fission is a word that uh, Frisch actually uh, introduced to physics. Just a few months later, nine months later, uh, Germany invaded Poland. A couple of years later, the United States entered the war. A few months later, the Manhattan Project was started. Uh, now, there's an interesting little bit of background history here. <clears throat> um, this discovery 
this explanation of fission, which Frisch and Meitner worked out on the 24th of December 1938, Frisch went back to Copenhagen where he was working and saw Niels Bohr, who was about to get on a boat to sail for America on the, I think the 6th of January. And on the trip over, Bohr worked out in great detail what was going on and basically spread the word very quickly through the east coast of the US. And within a month or so, all of the physicists uh, in the US were aware of this work and had reproduced the Hahn and Strassmann results. And they were already thinking about what impact this would have because of that C squared multiplier on the mass. And in uh, August, Two uh, scientists, Edward Teller and Leo Szilard, visited um, Albert Einstein, who was vacationing in upstate New York, and uh, talked to him about it. And they agreed the best thing they could do would be to sign, uh, to, well, to have a letter which Szilard largely dictated and Einstein signed that was to go to the President of the United States, essentially saying this discovery from just a few months before, has the potential to alter the outcome of this war. And it was also known that Germany had put a ban on exports of uranium, which gave strong uh, belief on the part of American scientists that they were planning an atomic weapons project. And they were certainly very competent people. So Einstein basically said to the president in his letter, and you can easily find this letter in a Google search, it's just a one-page letter that it really was imperative that the United States set up a comparable program and, and begin investigating this. For various reasons, it actually didn't reach Franklin Roosevelt's desk for uh, almost, well, a little over two years. And he actually signed a secret order on the 6th of December, 1941, the evening of the attack, before the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that secret order established the Manhattan Project, which initially began at Columbia University. Later got involved with the University of Chicago where Enrico Fermi was, and he set up an atomic pile that led to the first controlled fusion, uh, sorry, first controlled fission. And it also led to the creation of secret towns in Hanford, Washington, in the eastern part of Washington state along the Columbia River Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And of course, not everybody could name Hanford, but most people have certainly heard of Los Alamos. But I want to tell you a story about Los Alamos that relates to Utah. When this project was going, uh, was getting underway, there were two key players in the project. One of them was General Leslie Groves, who had been the architect of the Pentagon, and had successfully built that, and so had a huge pile of brownie points in the Defense Department, and he was assigned to head the Manhattan Project on the military side. And a Berkeley physicist named Robert, Robert Oppenheimer was to head the physics side of it. Uh, <clears throat> and the question was, where would they establish these labs? And the one that became Los Alamos was actually not the first choice. The first choice was a little town in our state called Oak City. How many know where Oak City is? Oh, okay, there's one. Anyone else? I'd lived here for 25 years. I didn't know where it was. I had to go look on a map. Oak City is 15 miles south of Delta. It's just a few hundred families. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice location. It's, it's pretty isolated uh, from everything. It has a sort of a half bowl behind it. Uh, and Groves said, if there weren't these farming families living here, this would be a good place. But the problem is we're gonna to have to buy them out and move them, it's tremendous disruption, it's gonna take time. Let's go look number two on our list, which turned out to be the Jimez Canyon on the edge of the plateau we now call the Los Alamos Plateau. He looked at that and he said, this is no good. He said, this canyon is far too narrow. We can't get big equipment in and out of here. It'll be a terrible bottleneck, it won't do. One of the physicists with him said, uh, General Groves, I've done a lot of horseback riding in this area, and up on the plateau, just above where we are now, the only thing that's up there is a boys' school called Los Alamos, the poplars or the cottonwoods in Spanish. And so Groves said, let's go look at it. And he got up there, and just like Brigham Young, he said, this is the right place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But you can imagine how Utah's history would have been different had Los Alamos National Laboratory been Oak City National Laboratory, just two hours drive from the universities along the Wasatch Front. Well, that project was extraordinarily successful. And in, in just under three years, they managed to explode the first atomic bomb. And of course, we know what that has meant for the history of mankind since then. <clears throat> and just three weeks later, flight crews who trained in Wendover uh, flew to Pinion Island and uh, later flew on on the 6th of August to Hiroshima, and three days later to Nagasaki. One was a plutonium bomb, was, one was a uranium bomb. And those two bombs basically ended the war five days later. However, it launched the nuclear arms race in the Cold War, and we've been living through it. And of course, in Utah, we have a very definite connection because Utahns and Southern Nevadans are, are downwinders. We lost a governor to uh, cancer from uh, fallout. Scott Matheson. Well, so that's some background of, of what fundamental quantum mechanics did to modern society. Let's now look at number theory, which is the source of the quote from G.H. Hardy at the, in 1940, who said it wouldn't be of any use whatsoever for war. Well, in 1976 and 75, researchers at two institutions that are pretty famous just across the Bay, San Francisco Bay from one another, uh, two of them at Stanford and one at, uh, at Berkeley, invented public key cryptography independently of one another. They didn't know about this. And, and uh, Merkel's work wasn't published until a couple of years later. But in fact, he had, he had done this project and handed it in, and his professor didn't, extend, didn't understand it. But uh, we'll see why this matters. And uh, the impact of this discovery was that it started a huge amount of research in cryptography. Essentially, for the last two and a half thousand years, when cryptography is known to have been used, it was the prerogative of a very small number of people. It was basically secret government agencies and kings and emperors and generals and so on, but the average citizen never saw it. And this is a count of publications in the cryptography bibliographies that I maintain, and I updated it for this talk. So I've got the figures for 2010. It's not that its interest is falling off, it's just that there's always a publication lag. But you can see we're, we've peaked at somewhere of the order of eight to 900 publications a year in research cryptography. Uh, now, interestingly, just before I gave, I gave this talk in 2005 for the first time, and just before I gave it, there was a new paper in the Journal of Cryptology in that had the phrase relativistic cryptography in it. And I did a web search at the time and found 17 documents. So I updated it last week and there's now 39 that Google can find that have relativity and cryptography in the, in the same document. So uh, even though you wouldn't think there's any connection between these widely disparate fields, in fact, there is a connection and some people have figured it out and maybe it'll matter in the future. It doesn't at the present time as far as I know, but it might. Um, <clears throat> going back to relativity, aside from uh, helping to explain how galaxies evolve and, and move, um, the, the primary practical application of cryptography, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, relativity has been in the GPS devices. It turns out that you need corrections from both special relativity, Einstein's 1905 theory, and general relativity is 1916 theory that's much, much more complicated, that involves the mathematics of curved spaces. Both of those corrections are essential, and all modern air traffic, both commercial and military, my brother-in-law is a retired navigator in the Indian Air Force, and he said by the 90s, they had essentially given up all the world's air force is the notion that you needed a navigator. Now there's a little device called a GPS device and everybody uses it. 
So um, to talk about cryptography, which leads into the final part of this talk, we need to introduce some words. And I'm just I'm not going to read out the definitions, but I'll just put them up a line or two at a time here. Because these are buzzwords that whoops, I'll go back here that appear in the cryptographic literature and they might not be familiar. Cryptanalysis is figuring out encrypted data. Plain text is the original message. Ciphertext is what you get after you encrypt it and so on. And uh, we also need to know a little bit about prime numbers, not very much. Uh, uh, prime numbers are numbers that cannot be divided by anything other than one and themselves without a remainder. And so there's the first hundred prime numbers. <clears throat> and steganography is a is the hiding of a message in another message. I mean, you might, for example, have a chunk of text like this today's New York Times, and you might have prearranged with someone that the first word, the first letter of each word in a paragraph to, together builds up a message. And most people would look at this and they'd see the news story. They wouldn't bother looking at the first character of every paragraph, or maybe the 17th if you'd arranged that, and that could carry a message that you wouldn't be able to see. Now, if you knew where it was hidden, you could obviously quickly find the message, but it's just the hiding of a message. In photography, it, you could do this with digital images just by changing low order bits of a high resolution uh, color value. And you wouldn't be able to see it visually, but you could certainly recover it. <coughs> the prime numbers even show up in cartoons, and I like this one from BC about what a prime number is. Um, so uh, here's, here's some simple cryptography. This one is extremely old. It goes back to the time of the Romans. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is that you take your regular alphabet in order that you've learned in school, and now you jumble all of those letters and you write them down in parallel, and then you connect the letters with lines, and that's your encryption policy. So if the if the general is sending out the message to his troops, attack at dawn, you simply look up those letters in the table and you get this funny jumble of letters that doesn't make much sense. Uh, and the soldier at the other end who has the job of decrypting this message for his lieutenant, he simply uses the table in the reverse order and recovers the message. And uh, the, at, the, at the time of Julius Caesar, there's a, a cipher was used that's called the Caesar cipher after him. It's a little bit simpler. It's simply based on taking the alphabet but then shifting it a certain number of places. But it's the same procedure. It just happens that this one is ordered instead of random. And you get a, an encrypted message as before. Now, the, one, the two important features of these substitution ciphers. One is that there's a secret key that controls how you encrypt and decrypt. So for, in the first case, it's, it's the complete jumbled alphabet. In the second case, it's just the number that is the shift in the alphabet. <clears throat> and uh, the second feature is that these practices of encryption and decryption are symmetric. There's one key, and it allows you to go in both directions. And it turns out that most cryptographic methods that are in use today have this property, but not public key cryptography, not the Diffie. Hellman Merkel idea. <clears throat> Back in the 1880s, a European scientist named Kirchhoff wrote up some principles for military cryptography. One of them is that it must be indecipherable. That's a fairly obvious requirement if, if it's going to be secure. But his second point was rather unexpected, that the method must not be required to be secret. And if the method, not the key, the method falls into the hands of the enemy, that won't help them a hoot. This is known as Kirchhoff's law in the cryptography business. And that's, that's not obvious. Most people would say, no, no, you have to keep it secret. But no, that's not the case. Same as the electrical Kirchhoff? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the key has to be communicatable uh, without the help of written notes. So it could be a passphrase, like passwords that you use to log into a computer system. And you have to be able to change it. And the reason you want to be able to change it is if, if you learn that the enemy has just captured the key, well, first thing you do is change the key. 
And the fact that they know how the method works won't help them because it's just as hard to crack messages uh, with the new key as it was before with the old key. And the old key doesn't help them with the new encryptions. And it must be compatible with the means of communication. This means that, for example, for if your uh, transmission system can transmit, uh, say, alphabetic characters, then it must not involve characters which are not alphabetic. If you remember uh, in telegraphy, there was a six-bit code, so you had 63 characters that were available. And uh, if you needed characters beyond that, you were basically out of luck. And it has to be portable, and it doesn't. It, it must not require the collusion of several people. You know, consider um, what happens with a certain kinds of safety deposit boxes. You have your key, and you go to the bank and say, "I want to open my safety deposit box," and you put your key in. But the bank manager has to come along with his key and put it in. And only when the two keys are provided are you able to withdraw the contents of the safety deposit box. And a similar thing applies for. Uh, banking between uh, different computers. And it must be easy to use. And the reason it has to be easy to use is that some of the circumstances where cryptography is used are stressful ones, the heat of battle. So you can't have a guy huddling in a foxhole going through a complicated decryption process. He's got to be able to do it relatively easily. And quickly, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what this boils down to in terms of security is you have to assume that um, the attacker may have captured the ciphertext, the encrypted material that's all garbled. And that, that attacker is going to try to examine that and see whether they can recover the original plain text. So the security then depends on keeping the plain text secret. I mean, obviously, if you put that up on a big billboard, you know, they, and they could read it with the field glasses, you're out of luck. Um, and the key has to be kept secret. And um, the security depends on the complexity of the key, because if your key was, uh, say, a word from a dictionary, the, all the attacker would have to do would be to take a list of words that were commonly used and found in a dictionary and try each one of them in turn. And it's easy to determine whether you've got the correct encryption because these, um, it got the correct key because of the symmetry of encryption and decryption. If what comes out produces what went in uh, w with encryption and decryption, then you know you've, you've successfully decoded the message. And it depends also on the strength and quality of the encryption method and how hard it is given the ciphertext to figure out what the original plain text was. Sometimes you can improve uh, security by hiding the word boundaries. For example, if the lieutenant in the field said, General, do we attack or not? And a two character response came back, the enemy knows the answer was no, if the, assuming it was an English army. English speaking army, and if it was a three character response, they know. So uh, in practice, word boundaries are always concealed by message padding, uh, and often with random characters. And you can also add random prefixes and suffixes and put the message in the middle, and a human can easily stare at the random jumble, random jumble, intelligent text, intelligible text, and, and recover the message. And you can even encrypt the encrypted stuff and have two or three encryption keys, and that may or may not make things harder. So you might think that it would always make things harder. Sometimes it actually makes things worse. So it's not an obvious thing to do, but it, it might be useful. Importantly, um, you can change the key regularly. And this was War II, where keys were originally kept for months at a time. This is particularly an issue with the, with the submarine navy. They, or, or even the surface navy, they sail out and they don't have any way of getting a new set of keys. They've carried the keys with them and they have to use them for a long period of time. The army being land-based could change them at somewhat more frequently and towards the end of World War II, keys were being changed two or three times a day. Uh, <clears throat> now, how does the crypt, crypt analyst attack a ciphertext? Well, if if he assumes that the encryption method is not very 
complicate it, then one thing that might be helpful is knowing something about the frequency of letter usage. And here are some examples from four disparate texts, Treasure Island, uh, a novel that children can read, a thesaurus, essentially ex explanations and relations of words, Shakespearean play Hamlet and Alice in Wonderland, which can be read by both children and adults with very different understanding. Uh, but one of the things you'll notice is that the commonest letters are much the same. In fact, there's even a programming language called Eto and Shardlu, which is essentially based on that first column uh, <coughs> of letter frequencies. And knowing that, then all you have to do is take the ciphertext, count up the frequencies of each of the letters in the ciphertext, use this table to substitute the English letters, and bang, you've probably figured out most of the message. And you don't have to get every character right because if you see T space E occurring quite a lot, you can figure the space part was an H because the is the commonest word in English text. <coughs> And the more ciphertext you have, the easier it is, because then your frequency assignments are likely to be more reliable. The reality today is that the good cryptanalysts have automated tools on computers now that can attack all of the common encryption schemes. There's a whole journal devoted uh, to the history of cryptography. It's called Cryptologia. It was founded at West Point, but is now uh, published by a commercial publisher in England, Taylor and Francis. Uh, and so essentially all of the, the, the known encryption schemes that are, have been used in the past are going to be in the repertoire of cracking software that cryptanalysts have at their disposal. And importantly, some government agencies, we have one called No Such Agency, oh sorry, National Security Agency. <laughs> Uh, it used to be called no such agency because it, they, the government would not admit to its existence and it didn't have an, an, an item in the budget. It was hidden inside the defense budget. It actually now is recognized as the National Security Agency. There's even a cryptographic museum there outside of Washington, D.C. that I hope in the not too distant future to get to visit. And the point is these agencies have basically unlimited funds and they have secret budgets, so we don't even know how much they, they have. And, they're, and they're, if you're a mathematician or looking for a job, you may be interested in them. And, and this is somewhat relevant because they are building a very large data center at the south end of the Salt Lake Valley on the west side, and they're going to hire of the order of a 1,000 programmers. And of course, the problem with agencies like that is that when they crack an encryption scheme, they don't tell you about it. They don't write scientific papers in the literature. It's all secret. So you may be using a system and you think it's secure, but they may have cracked it long ago and they're not going to say a word about it. Uh, <clears throat> both the United States and Britain monitor all transatlantic telephone and network traffic. Everything is captured. It doesn't mean they're humans sitting, living, t listening to every single phone conversation, but there are computer programs looking for keywords that will then flag messages for a human to sit down and analyze in more detail. So the, the problem then is that for simple cryptographic methods, pretty much everything is crackable if you have enough ciphertext. <clears throat> and also if you keep the key the same, the same letter input becomes the same letter output. So that makes frequency analysis easier. And if you use the same key, from day to day or next month, um, it, it's going to make it easier for the analyst. And if the analyst can su succeed in getting you to encrypt something he's given you, this actually can happen. Uh, uh, for example, one side in a war would put out a press release about the progress of the war, and the other side would transmit this in encrypted form to their headquarters. And so now the one side has succeeded in getting them to encrypt them. So they know what the input is, and they now know what the output is. And then they have to say, well, how did we get from the input to the output? And uh, that is really quite important if, if you can succeed in doing it. A problem with, with all encryptions, if the keys are captured and you haven't been able to detect they've been captured, then all traffic in the future and all of your past traffic too with those keys is compromised. And 
the more serious problem is that you have to share keys. As I mentioned in the case of the submarines, they had to start out with code books that they got in their home base ports and sail out into the Atlantic and the Pacific and, uh, and use those for a long period of time. And that makes it if impossible then to change those keys if headquarters believes the keys have been compromised. And there was actually a, a German submarine captured in the mid-Atlantic in the mid-1940s in the middle of the war where they were actually able to recover the code books. And that was extremely important for both American and British naval intelligence to continue uh, their successful decryption of German military traffic. And um, the other problem with, with cryptography, if you're doing it electronically, is that you can't tell whether you've been eavesdropped. If you send it in printed form, you can't tell whether someone has photographed it. Uh, at least if it's if it's in an obvious form. And uh, even if the attacker cannot decrypt your encrypted messages, he still can determine that you're sending traffic. And that turns out in the military situation to be extremely important. And it was used very heavily in World War II on both sides to try to figure out where was the attack coming next. When they saw a lot of radio traffic in one part of Europe, they said that's where the troop buildup is. You know, that's where we gotta be prepared for an attack in the next few days. <clears throat> so uh, the simple encryption schemes like the substitution ciphers work on a character or if you're working in binary a bit at a time and they're called stream ciphers. And they have the characteristic that a given input character always shows up as the same output character no matter where it appears. It, this has the benefit that if there's a transmission error in the message, only a single character is garbled and everything is, is still decryptable except that one character and you can usually fill it in by context. Unless it's something that's not obvious like say a, a digit in a map coordinate. Uh, <clears throat> a better way of doing things is to do what's called uh, block encryption where you take a block of characters and you use a method that jumbles everything up in the block so that the way a particular input character gets encrypted depends on everything else in the block and that block is the input plain text. So that's going to change with every message. So it's, it does a good job of mixing things. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if you get a transmission error, the whole block is blown because nothing will decrypt. So it does mean that you have to have reliable communications. Now on the internet today, we've sort of gotten used to this because the network protocols that were developed in the 60s and 70s and 80s essentially provide us reliable communications. It's very, very uncommon to get uh, any kind of corruption in data we move back and forth. In fact, we don't even think about it these days. We download software packages in source form and binary form and we expect them to compile if they're, soft, if they're source code or just run directly if they're binary. We don't think about that something might have been changed. Still, um, good software dis distribution schemes do use checksums or digital signatures to uh, allow you to verify that what you got is what they had at the other side and that nothing was damaged in root. <clears throat> now, uh, you then ask, well, if the cryptanalysis, crypt analyst is the word I always have trouble with, uh, is, is going to be foiled entirely, what could I do? Well, what you have to do is to make sure that every input character is encrypted differently every time. So if an A comes in in the stream, it shows up as a Q over here, then the next time it's an M and next time it's a B and sometimes it's an A, but it's every time it occurs in the message, it's different. And there's a way to do that. And uh, here's a simple way to apply it. We, we pick a favorite book. You might happen to like uh, Moby Dick. And here's the first couple of sentences from it. And the idea is that you pick these letters in turn as the base of the shift for a Caesar cipher, a simple, a simple alphabetic shift. And you'll see that as you progress to this, you'll get mostly different encryptions. Now, unfortunately, you notice there are some things that get repeated here. Um, let's see here, it's hard to see here. 
Well, that probably occurs more than once, yes, a few times. Uh, and there, were, there are characters that are repeated too here, little. Uh, so there is still a bit of structure left in this. And uh, that we can decipher. And then what do you do when you run out of all of the characters in the book? Well, you need a new book that's different. Now you have to switch to Tale of Two Cities or something like that. You cannot reuse this pad, this one-time pad, this stream of, of encryption rules because that will weaken your communications. What you really want is a completely random string of letters. And this brings us back to last week's subject, random numbers. And I talked then about two kinds of random numbers. There are those that come from physical processes like uh, electrical noise, lava lamps, quantum fluctuations, and so on. And then there are the kinds that are predictable. The problem is that the good ones that are really random, like the lava lamp, uh, are really of no use here because both sides have to have the same encryption stream or the same uh, string of random numbers. So uh, what you do instead is you use an algorithmic method for generating random numbers and the seed, the initial random number that starts the whole generator working, is your encryption key. So here's an example. I need to take a swallow of water here. Uh, we, <coughs> we have a little function called encrypt and it gets a key and a message. We start out with a simple one character message uh, and the output in hexadecimal. This is, goes back to Kirchhoff's rule that you, you have to be able to use the encryption system with the communications method you have and I want it to be visible by humans so we can't have unprintable characters coming out. So we do it in hexadecimal. And the letter A has become the hexadecimal character whose number is 2B, 32 plus 11, number 43. And where does the rest of the stuff come from? Well, that's message padding. Every message is going to get padded to a constant length. So we don't really care, but the, the attacker doesn't know. He just sees the string of data. Now, if we encrypt the string AB, well, the B is now, even though it's only one position away from A, it gets a completely different value, 47 hexadecimal, but the A is still the same. And if we do A, B, C, and uh, A, B, C, D, what you observe is that the same leading character gets encrypted the same way every time. And that's definitely a weakness. However, if you have a repeated letter, you then end up with completely different characters. So it really is jumbled. So the attacker really has no way of inverting this mapping and discovering that each of these hexadecimal pairs maps back to the same character. And so here's an example. We take a, a statement from American Revolutionary History and we encrypt it and we print it out and we get a string of hexadecimal garbage to a human. And now you put your other hat on, you're now the attacker, and you try to decrypt this. So you remember in, in Kirchhoff's law that we can't assume the method is secret. So both sides have the encryption and decryption functions. So the attacker runs the decrypt function and tries key 122. He just guessed it out of the air. He puts in the ciphertext that we had in the previous screen, and he gets garbage. If he puts in the correct one, 123, he gets back the correct message and, and sees immediately this is what he expected to discover, and tries an, another key nearby and gets garbage again. So uh, a lesson of this is that knowing the key approximately isn't good enough. You either have to know the key exactly or it's useless. So <clears throat> the problem we have is that even though we've got good methods for generating random numbers and methods that will produce numbers that are to a very high degree of probability random by various statistical tests. The problem is they're generated algorithmically. And cryptanalysts have actually asked the question, if you gave me a string of random numbers from your generator, can I recover both the key, the, the initial seed in your generator, and, and, uh, and tell you also what algorithm you're using? 
And unfortunately for a lot of the common uh, random number generators that have been used over the last 50 years, the answer is yes. You, with actually relatively small amounts of random numbers from one of these uh, generators, you can in fact determine what the original method was and what its seed was. And as I mentioned, if you use lava lamps or radioactive decay quantum fluctuations, those aren't reproducible. You can't, they're simply com completely impractical because they could never generate the same stream at both ends of the communications channel. And with all of them, no, no matter uh, how good your stream of random numbers in the one-time pad is, you still have to distribute this one-time pad to sender and receiver. So uh, now we ask, well, why was public key cryptography so important? Well, the reason it's important is it solved the key distribution problem. This was the huge problem for the military. How do I get a secure code book out to my army in the field or my submarine in the middle of the Atlantic? I can't transmit it electronically over the airwaves because the enemy's gonna capture that and try to recover it. So I may have to physically transport it, and that's problematic if it's a submarine somewhere that's a long ways away. So uh, what public key, key cryptography allows you to do is to have, uh, instead of a single shared secret key, you have a pair of keys, one that's called public and one that's called private. And <clears throat> the keys are related, and we'll, we'll look briefly at, at one of these in a little bit, but the essential idea is that you have some mathematical function that's easy to apply in one direction, but not easy to apply in the reverse direction, that is to find its inverse. And uh, these are sometimes called one-way trapdoor problems or algorithms. An example is if it's easy to throw a needle into a haystack, but it's a lot harder to get it out. So um, for prime number factorization, I bring this one in because it was the one that was invented first in a, a company called RSA, which stands for Ravest, Shamir, and Adelman, the three founders of the company in, I think, Boston. Uh, they have been one of the leading companies in this business really since the early 1980s for about 30 years now. And if you have small numbers, it's not too hard to guess uh, possible divisors of that number. For example, the bottom number ends in a two, so we know for sure it's divisible by two. And when we divide it by two, we end up with a zero there, and we know that's divisible by two as well, and so we get two factors of two. So you can fairly quickly determine the prime factors. But when the numbers get big, it gets hard. Uh, and it's not, easy, it's not obvious by looking at them. These, well, you can tell that these are composite because they are even. But these two end in an odd digit, so you don't know whether they are prime or whether they're products of primes. And the problem is that if you have a number of n digits, it can be represent a value up to about 10 to the n. You have to try about the square root of that number randomly to guess what the factors are. And so by making the number, say, 200 digits long, you have to try all numbers up to 100 digits. And I remember last time I mentioned the number of particles in the universe is about 10 to the 80th. So you simply cannot try all 100 digit numbers. It's, it could not possibly happen. So here's how it works for secure communication. Two people, Alice and Bob, these are conventional in the cryptography business. Uh, I, th I think there was a movie called, was it Alice and Bob and Carol and Ted or something? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it had nothing to do with cryptography as far as I know. Anyway, Alice and Bob want to communicate. So what Alice does is takes Bob's public key, encrypts her message and sends it to him. Bob takes his private key, decrypts it. He sends his response back, encrypt it with Alice's public key, and she takes her, her secret private key and recovers the message. And so if you have, if you two people each have a public and a private key, they can communicate securely. And an attacker can't uh, come in as an imposter because they don't know the private keys. So this is really an astoundingly good idea that if the keys are sufficiently long and they're based on a, a problem that is 
sufficiently difficult to solve, then um, we can be quite confident that nobody, not even the NSA, can decode these messages. Now we'll see there are other ways, but so it, it's not very difficult then to extend this idea to allow you to make unforgeable digital signatures as long as the private keys remain private. And that's important for commerce. You know, companies used to have, uh, say the CEOs would get together and they'd both in the presence of one another sign contracts that obligated the two companies to do something of mutual benefit to both. But in a worldwide uh, commercial environment, that gets very painful. You don't really want to have to travel around the world for every contract your company signs. So you really would like a way to sit in your office and have a computer take over and put an unforgeable digital signature on your message. Uh, <clears throat> for the case of prime factorization that RSA is based on, this is a problem that's been studied for over 2,000 years by people in mathematics. And we still believe it's intractable, that the only way to, to find the prime factors of a large number is to try all possible factors up to its square root. Uh, importantly, there are other methods that involve different kinds of functions. They're radically different. One is called elliptic curves. Another one is called discrete logarithms. These have no relationship really to one another, but they do have this characteristic that's easy to go in one direction and not in the other. And the reason we want to have this is because if next week some mathematician in China announces to the world that he has found a fast practical way to crack the prime factors of arbitrary numbers in a reasonable amount of computer time, RSA is out of business. We need fallbacks. And so all modern communication systems are designed so that the cryptographic method is a plug-in module and they're all prepared to try different kinds. If you work on Unix systems, you probably are comfortable with using SSH username at hostname to, to log in as that user on another computer. And what you'll discover if you do man SSH to get the manual page or look in its configuration file in your home directory is there's a whole list of different ciphers it can use. There's a default one which is believed to be relatively secure, but if that one is ever cracked, more everybody just changes the method and uh, we're safe again. The problem with public key methods is because they involve arithmetic on very, very large numbers that they're not fast. You know, there's no hardware on any computer today that you can buy commercially that will do arbitrary precision uh, arithmetic. It's all done in software and that makes it about 100 to 1,000 times slower than hardware for normal arithmetic. So you can't use these for routine high-speed communication at gigabits per second. What you instead do and what SSH does in the Unix world is it uses randomly generated keys, which it, it likes to get from things like dev u random and dev random that I talked about last week, uh, to generate a random key that it sends to the other side and said, here, here's my public key. Uh, and the other side will do something similar in the exchange with public key methods, uh, a key that will now be used for a symmetric method, which is fast. And one of the best ones today is the advanced encryption standard developed in a worldwide competition about 10 years ago by the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which used to be known as the National Bureau of Standards in Gatorsburg, Maryland, just north of Washington. So um, <clears throat> if you're using SSH to log into another machine or you're sitting in a web browser and it says HTTPS, Hypertext Transport Protocol Secure, you actually are using public key methods already. But all that, that has been used for is to create a key from a, a random source that's sent to the other side and then used for uh, a symmetric encryption method. And that makes it pretty darn reliable and, and essentially uncrackable. <coughs> Except humans get in the way here. Humans have to implement these things. What do humans do? They make mistakes. There's a great quote in one of the Snoopy cartoons of, of uh, Lucy saying, I never make mistakes. I thought I did once, but I was wrong. <laughs> uh, but in reality, software is a lot more complex than a one-line 
uh, cartoon. So uh, people make mistakes. In fact, in August, there was the annual Black Hat Conference. This is a conference at which people in computer security get together and, and uh, talk about progress in improving computer security and also in attacking it. And one of the papers presented was a look at the HTTPS protocol. And they found that roughly 80% of the several hundred websites that they examined had flawed implementations that allowed them to defeat the security. So even though you think you're talking to your bank over a secure connection, in principle it, it is secure, but because humans screwed up in writing the software, it isn't secure. So uh, that's, that's an issue. Now, what does this have to do with citizens? Well, public key cryptography solves the key exchange problem, and it lets you transmit very hard to crack keys for symmetric methods. That's, that's certainly important. And it allows individuals to communicate with reasonable confidence that even the NSA can't read what they're uh, writing. Of course, there is the problem that the keys are subject to compromise. How can that happen? Well, you might post it on a, a post-it note on your bulletin board beside your computer, just like you do with your password, because it's long and you, you can't remember it. Um, it can be gotten by eavesdropping, or they can put a gun to your head, or they can simply say, we'll send you to prison for the rest of your life unless you give up your key. That's the usual technique that many governments take, and it's pretty effective. Uh, and there is an issue here with uh, verification of keys, because if, if Bob and Alice know one another, they can get together and say, Alice, here's my key, and Alice says to Bob, Bob, here's my key, and they believe that these are the keys, because they talk to one another face to face, and they know each other, and they trust one another. But for businesses on opposite sides of the world, this is a problem. So uh, what is a solution that might work? Well. Um, there are some big companies, VeriSign is the, probably the largest in this business. What they essentially do is they say, for a fee, we will generate a pair of uh, keys for you, and we will certify them that, that we generated them. And you can believe us because you're paying us money and we're big and, and trustworthy. And uh, then when someone else gets your, your public key and wants to use it, they say, oh, it's signed by VeriSign, must be, must be correct, it's not an imposter's key. Well, um, when I wrote this in 2005, I just said, all this does is transfer the problem of trust from an individual that you might know to an organization that you don't really know personally and you have no control over it, so why should you have confidence in it? And so I don't think that's a good solution, but it's what most companies are using today. Uh, in July, a Dutch company that issues certificates called DigiNotar uh, was, had their website compromised and the attacker succeeded in using their internal software to forge keys for a number of big companies like Microsoft, Google, and others. Uh, with the result now that uh, there are certificates embedded in people's computers all over the world that have DigiNotar attached to them and that can't be trusted. And so the industry has been scrambling for the last two months to figure out what to do. And uh, you know, we are here the last day of September, so we are barely two months after this. This company has already gone bankrupt because their business fell to zero within days of the announcement of the attack. But the cleanup job still remains because we have to find all of their certificates on all of the world's computers, and that's a lot of them, and replace them. So what Microsoft and Apple who are two of the biggest personal computer vendors have been doing, is changing software and pushes that are going out within the last few days and for the next couple of months are simply going to investigate the keys that are stored in each machine that the software is installed on. And if it sees digit notar in the signature, it's going to throw it away and, and simply refuse to believe it. So it, <clears throat> we, we don't have a really good solid solution to this problem yet. Perhaps uh, large corporations like VeriSign are about as best we can do. But it would be better if you really had personal contact. Uh, <coughs> now, the, in the free software community, people have said, well, look, we, when we were little communities in a given city, we could get together and have a key signing party. And we all hand each other a business card with our key printed on. And we all agree that we've seen each other in these meetings. And we trust this little group of people. But that doesn't help you for the person across the country. 
So uh, one solution is to say, well, when you create a public key, private key pair, you register your public key in a number of servers around the world. And the reason you do this is if you register it only in, at one site, well, how do, you, how do you know that site hasn't been attacked? It becomes very improbable if you can do this at a number of sites. And it also means that if you're in different countries, the laws of one country can't suddenly come and bite you because you've got a copy elsewhere. Uh, you may have been following the WikiLeaks story over the last couple of months, and uh, you may have heard from Julian Assange in his interviews that they actually store this data in a number of places around the world for precisely that reason, and the data is encrypted. And they were in hot water a week or so ago when it was announced some attackers have figured out what their encryption keys were. <clears throat> so the question is, it, it looks like cryptography gave us a, has given us a secure way of communicating, um, and is that the case? And unfortunately not. And there's uh, a well-known author in this area named Bruce Schneier, who has written two books on uh, the practice of cryptography, that is the mathematics and the computer software and so on behind it. But he's also written um, <clears throat> some other books uh, two of them that are worthy of note are called Secrets and Lies and Beyond Fear that are not, they have no mathematics, no software in them. They're about the impact of cryptography on our society. And <clears throat> the problem is that there are lots of ways to get uh, plain text back from encryption text. Uh, compromise of the keys, capturing the keyboard input, capturing uh, text off screen images, um, and so on. And there are plenty of weaknesses in this area. One of the first encrypt wired encryption, sorry, wireless encryption protocol, that was one of the first protocols used for wireless networks. And it turns out to be so easy to crack that you can find software that you can download for free. And in a, in a couple of minutes, you can crack anything that's encrypted, even though it's got a random key because there are weaknesses in its implementation. Microsoft Windows passwords uh, are enormously insecure for a variety of reasons that I won't go into here. Uh, cell phones also are problematic. Um, so uh, the reality is, is that faulty software has reduced or eliminated security. But it's important that when you use encryption, you only use methods that have been widely researched and studied uh, because of those are the only ones that you're likely to be able to have confidence in. Unfortunately, there are a number of companies out on the market who say we have proprietary encryption schemes that will ensure your data is never attacked by someone else. Uh, and that's just pure rubbish. Bruce Schneier calls those companies snake oil companies. And security by obscurity means, well, we won't tell you what the algorithm is, but trust us, it's secure. Well, that's not secure. And as Schneier points out, the fact that the, these companies always put it on the website, nobody's ever cracked our, our encryption method. Well, he says, look, that just means because nobody gives a hoot. They're not important enough in, in the business. The only reason to believe that something is secure is when lots of people that are really smart in this field have tried and failed. So this is actually an area of publication where failures are published a lot. Um, <clears throat> but it, what it does mean, however, is that if you have encrypted your data, you have a problem. Because if you lose that key or forget it, or the key is, is owned by the employee in your company who had the job of encrypting the data, and she leaves or gets run over by a bus, your data's gone. Now, what she could do is leave and say, hey, I've got your key. If you want your data back, I need 100 grand in my Cayman Islands bank account. <laughs> Uh, and that, that has actually happened multiple times. So this is a big issue. If you do do encryption, you have to think really, really seriously about the security of your keys. And this usually means there have to be multiple copies deposited in various places with your lawyer, when, uh, with a safety deposit box somewhere, perhaps on a site outside the Salt Lake Valley, so that when the earthquake comes, it's going to survive even if you don't, and so on. So. Uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, I, I've got a number of points here where I'm running a little bit over time, but I'm close to the end here. Uh, there are a whole bunch of 
examples of modern technology that are being used with the notion that these can make things secure or give society some sort of benefit. But in reality, as with all technology, starting with the first axe that was really good for splitting a piece of wood or uh, hammering a bear over the head so you could have dinner that night, um, <clears throat> can also be used for bad things like hammering other people. And so all of these problem, all of these examples here have bad side effects. Uh, and things like surveillance and scanning are now becoming exceedingly common and <clears throat> have been used already in a number of court cases where people claimed they had an alibi, they weren't anywhere near the scene of the crime, but there was local video camera footage or uh, toll booth, uh, electronic toll booth records. That in fact, they were near the scene of the crime. Uh, one that a lot of people aren't familiar with was discovered about a year ago, and that is that <clears throat> if you have encryption keys in your computer, you might think when you turn your laptop off that everything is vaporized because the memory DRAM is, is uh, believed to be, uh, non -vol to be volatile. Uh, in fact, this is not true. It retains what is stored in it for some minutes. And if you take a can of uh, Freon coolant and spray those memory chips as soon as you've powered off the machine, you can make that data last for hours. And if you keep it cold enough, you, you can keep it even for days and you can get all of the data back. So if the attacker steals your laptop and has got a can of Freon handy, the chances are he can keep everything that was in memory. And one of the things that was probably in memory was your encryption keys, because they're needed to decrypt the traffic that's coming in. I've got a new computer. Do you want it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, last week in the news, they, uh, there was a story how kids in, in Swedish kindergartens are now being outfitted with little GPS location tracker vests that when they go on an outing, if they wander off, they can find them. Now, most parents say, this is wonderful, I can find my kid. I had a kid disappear in a store once and we got pretty panicky. I, you know, I understand that, but the same thing can be used for other people. In Britain, uh, there are cameras all over the place and uh, they have number plate recognition software and they can look up and make sure and find out whether you've paid your taxes or have outstanding traffic fines and nail you. Uh, there's a problem that's going to become increasingly present because just over the last couple of years there's been strong pressure on the part of some parts of the world, notably China, but it impacts many other countries, to be able to use the letters in their writing systems in internet host names. Now, it's, most of you are probably aware that Chinese do not use an alphabetic system. They use essentially a pictographic system, one character, one word, uh, where the character doesn't give any clue of pronunciation and meaning, you just have to memorize the mapping between one and the other. But in the Unicode character set, which is what all computers are moving to in Microsoft Windows from version, from Vista onward is essentially purely Unicode, has the feature that it encodes all of the world's printed alphabets. And uh, we have alphabets where those three those six letters, IBM.com, could be I, B, M, or A, O, T, B, T, M, U, or E, V, M in Russian or Greek or Latin, where they look identical. You cannot tell by looking at the URL in the bar that this IBM.com is not the one you think it is. It could be a site in Russia or in Greece. So this is going to be a huge problem, and, and a lot of the opposition to allowing internationalized domain names has been based on this observation. And there is no solution to this problem. Com countries are pushing to have their alphabets allowed and it's going to become a bigger problem. Very few people are aware that all color printers manufactured in the United States today on every output page, including every one of these I'm handing out at the end here, uh, with the right kind of light, you can see in faint yellow an identification of the printer and the time that the output was printed on. This was put in at the demand of the US government. On that yep, yep. So if you're using your great color printer, which does a nice job of pictures and US $100 bills and other things, 
uh, the FBI and the Secret Service are going to get you. Yeah, here, here's another example. Bluetooth communications for short distance wireless, say between keyboards and a computer or uh, between your Bluetooth phone and, and your stereo in your car. Um, thieves are now using the fact that there's a short distance uh, wireless signal to just walk down the street with a little detector. Oh, I got a signal. Oh, there's nothing on the back seat of the car. Bam, it's in the trunk. And they've just stolen your laptop. Uh, so uh, as George Orwell wrote probably 70 or 80 years ago, looking far into the future, Big Brother is watching you. And this is, I think, a really serious problem that not enough people are uh, talking about. And I'm, I'm getting very close to the end here now. So there, there are lots of abuses of this. There are good things like the, the statement I made six years ago about making it hard for dictatorships to survive. And we saw that happening this year in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya. Uh, the problem is that these systems are really not understood by the public and not even by the legislators. So because they're new and glitzy, people want to adopt them. Yesterday, there was a report that a survey of Canadians, when asked about internet voting, responded like 99% in favor of it, because it's convenient. Isn't it wonderful? Everybody has a cell phone. That's great. So they want to vote uh, with the same convenience. But they, what they don't understand is that it might not be advisable. And the key problem with electronic voting systems, independent of what country they're implemented in, is you cannot secure them. I'm going to tell you about that on the next slide. You can't trust them and you can't audit them. Even though you typed in candidate A, Republican, candidate B, Democrat, and so on, and for various offices, you don't know that what you typed in is what was recorded. And co companies said, well, we'll just give you a receipt that shows you what you voted for. What does that mean? They print out the receipt, what you typed in. What they record could be something completely different. And it is impossible to tell whether that has happened or not. Uh, a speaker from Stanford a couple of years ago on our campus said, look, he said, to put the analogy into something that doesn't involve computers, imagine if your voting system walked, involved you walking into the voting place and you sit down in a chair and there's a black curtain and you hear this rustling behind the curtain and there's a human there. So you talk to the human and say, well, candidate A, I want for the dog catcher and candidate B, I want for the county recorder and so on. And he said, supposing that was how you voted, would you trust that the ballot put into the ballot box is what you selected? Of course you wouldn't. Well, we have the same problem with electronic voting. The difference is that with paper ballots, you can subvert the process in a few areas. You can stuff the box with, uh, in favor of one candidate or other. Chicago used to be famous for this back in the Mayor Daly senior time. Uh, but you can't do it on a wide scale. You could never do it for a national election or even a statewide election. But with electronic voting, you can. And does it matter? Of course it matters. Control of the world's largest economy, that's the biggest prize you can find in this planet. Uh, <clears throat> now, how much do you have to fiddle the election? Well, I merely observed that over the last uh, 15 years, we have had a Washington state election for governor, a Mexican presidential election, and two US presidential elections that have been ties within the margin of error of the voting systems. So you don't necessarily have to make a 99% landslide vote for Adolf Hitler, like uh, tends to happen in dictatorships. Um, you only have to shift the balance a few percent and you, you can nail your, your candidate and put him into office. This appeared today as the 30th. This was two days ago, just at lunchtime. Uh, researchers at Argonne Laboratory have shown that for less than $10, you can take the latest Diebold voting system, and Diebold is the largest company in the US for selling these things, and you can modify in such a way uh, that the voting machine cannot detect it's been hacked, and the user of the machine can't either. This is really worrisome. So uh, this is the second last slide. Oops, let me. Uh, these are the lessons I think every citizen needs to take away and, and learn about technology is you have to learn the limits of technology, even though it sounds good and wonderful and, and offers all kinds of conveniences. 
when it can be used to your disadvantage, you want to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't do this after all. And uh, certainly as the 20th century has shown, the, the impact on society of uh, basic technology like cryptography, number theory, relativity, quantum mechanics, and so on, you, you have no possibility of predicting when those come out what they're going to be used for. Relativity we basically went from 1905 to 1939, 34 years before E equals MC squared meant anything practical. Uh, we should be very uh, concerned about government attempts to destroy freedom by putting in strong controls like the United States Patriot Act and the Guantanamo detentions. <clears throat> you should, I th in my view, you should oppose, uh, oppose database aggregation. Uh, why do countries issue you with a personal identification number? Well, how many Jim Smiths are there in the country? There are quite a lot, and there's a Jim Smith Society where they all get together every year and meet one another. Hi, Jim. Good to meet you, Jim. Um, personal names are not unique handles, but personal numbers distributed by the government uh, is uh, are unique numbers. And once you've got that unique number, it's a handle on this individual, even if she marries and changes her name, she still has the same original number. And so companies can sell each other data and merge it. And so one company has got salary data, another company has got address data, a third company has got buying habits. And by selling this data back and forth, they can agglomerate a huge amount of information that you really have no control of. And, and you, can't, you can't find out what they have. You can't get them to remove it, even if it's wrong. Uh, insurance companies have done studies that show about a third of the data they recorded is wrong. So there's a lot of wrongness in what's being recorded here. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, but if it's wrong that says, you know, you're a total credit flake and, and no bank in, in the country is going to give you a loan on the house you want it to buy, even though you've got a healthy income and you think you ought to be able to buy a house, then you may not be so happy about that. So, you know, what can you do? Well, the important thing is to try to stay informed, and here are some sources that you can go to. Uh, the, the electronic voting one, um, well, in most of these, you're not using uh, a secure connection. Notice they're all HTTP, except for one of them, which is, uh, uh, and, and that's, I, di I did a cut and paste. You can take off the S here, and you can still get to the, that journal's website. Uh, <clears throat> What, what I think as citizens we really ought to be doing is asking a lot more of our legislators about why, what is the need to buy these electronic voting machines. This is the most serious problem today, I think. Earlier this week in the news, they were commenting that these, the lifetime of these machines has turned out to be not all that great, and so they're a very, very expensive way. Why don't we just go back to paper ballots? Because we, that cannot be subverted. Sure, it's tedious. Sure, it's going to take us maybe 24 hours to get the final results. We can wait. We're electing them for four years or six years or two years. Another day doesn't matter. But at least it's secure. And no voting machine, in my view, can ever be made secure, no matter what they tell you. Because uh, even if somebody invents some theoretical scheme that would, in principle, make it secure, humans are going to implement it. They're going to make mistakes. There are going to be ways to attack the system. And as I say, because of close elections, you don't have to attack it very much, just a little bit. Um, I've got two sets of handouts here. I'll, I'll stop here for questions. One is just copies of the slides, and the other is a two-page story from a journal issue that came on Wednesday about how the European Union is essentially outlawing electronic voting. So, questions, anyone? What about um, quantum computing for 